We should be clear that in principle this resembles the earlier ban very closely. It's still a 90-day ban on the citizens of six mainly Muslim countries. Admittedly, as you say, Iraq is off that list. And for Syrian refugees, they are no longer permanently banned. But they are, together with every other refugee, banned from the US for the next three months. Now, much of what caused the protests at the airports was that there were travellers caught unawares by the previous order. They were already on planes to the US. They were turned around and sent home or detained. This order should avoid that. Uh, it doesn't come into effect for another 10 days. It doesn't apply to people with green cards or visas or refugees whose travel bans have already been, sorry, whose travel plans have already been sanctioned by the State Department. The overt preference that we saw previously for non-Muslim citizens has disappeared. But the question remains, have they changed it enough to avoid another embarrassing failure? Last time President Trump signed off on his executive order, it was live in front of the television cameras in the Oval Office. It's big stuff. Big stuff indeed. But today, no fanfare, just a still photo of the president in a golden glow at his desk for what Americans call a do-over. Immigration travel ban 2.0. In front of the television cameras today, three of his cabinet secretaries barely consulted last time around, but now the front men for the reversioned ban. To our allies and partners around the world, please understand this order is part of our ongoing efforts to eliminate vulnerabilities that radical Islamist terrorists can and will exploit for destructive ends. The Department of Justice believes that this executive order just as the first executive order, is a lawful and proper exercise of presidential authority. We are going to work closely to implement and enforce it humanely, respectfully, and with professionalism, but we will enforce the law. Is this an acknowledgement that the first order was flawed in many ways? And they took no questions but sought to present a preemptive legal defense to head off the inevitable court challenges to come. There was a paroxysm of protest at airports to meet the last presidential order by those who judged a ban on refugees and hundreds of thousands of Muslim citizens to be cruel, un-American and counterproductive. While the new order is legally more narrow, it doesn't differ much in principle. Iraq is off the list of banned Muslim-majority nations. Now it applies to citizens of Sudan, Syria, Iran, Somalia, Yemen and Libya. Where there had been an indefinite ban on refugees from Syria, now they, along with all other refugees, are temporarily blocked from the US for 120 days. But perhaps the biggest change is that green card holders and those with current visas are not included. Still, for opponents to the ban, fundamental flaws remain, and they reject any argument it makes America safer. Countries of origin is simply not a reliable way to determine who in the future might commit an act of terror. If it was, uh, you would have Pakistan on that list, and of course Pakistan is nowhere to be found. There's a week before the order will be applied at America's borders, regardless of the president's claims that the first order had to be made without warning to keep bad dudes from rushing into the country. Still, it's a useful diversion for America's CEO from a whole other world of controversy. The President of the United States put his own reputation, the reputation of his predecessor, and the reputation of his nation at risk to get at least a draw out of the next 24-hour news. That's the former CIA director Michael Hayden dismissing the president's accusation made at the weekend on Twitter that Barack Obama wiretapped his phones in Trump Tower. It was an unexpected contribution to the roiling scandal over Russian links to the Trump campaign team that played out on Friday with calls for his attorney general to resign. No wonder his chief strategist Steve Bannon glimpsed through the window of the Oval Office appeared animated at week's end. The White House is counting on the travel ban this time to go as planned. And here's a little more on the fallout from that tweet storm, and there's been quite a lot. It seems that James Comey, the current FBI director, has now implored the Department of Justice to issue a public rebuttal of the president's claims that his phones were wiretapped on the orders of President Obama. The White House, meanwhile, has effectively asked Congress to find evidence to back up President Trump's tweet, which is a bit like people were asked to find evidence of widespread voter fraud when that was something the president claimed in a tweet. Now, it seems likely that this may be 
was something that came across his radar via cable TV and he amplified it. His spokespeople today have defended him by saying, look, he knows more than you do. He knows more than everyone else because he gets briefed. But I do think it's fair to observe that an outcome of this will be a broadening of inquiries into possible Trump campaign links to Russia. So it's certainly not making the issue go away. And I think laying the blame for it at the feet of President Barack Obama was clearly a very risky strategy. Now joining us from New York is Scotty Nell Hughes, one of Donald Trump's most high profile supporters. And in Washington is John Sandrick, who was director of US Immigration and Customs Enforcement under President Obama. Uh, first of all, John Sandrick, does this uh, executive order now look to you like an enforceable piece of uh, potential legislation? Well, it certainly addresses some of the major legal concerns with the original order. I think it's very clear that they took counsel of a number of lawyers in, in, in changing the scope of the, the order so that it doesn't apply to green card holders and other populations that I think were clearly unconstitutional. Uh, I mean, th that actually highlights, Scotty Nell Hughes, that perhaps the whole thing could have been rather better done in the first place. I absolutely agree with you, and I think this second go-around, this 2.0 version, is exactly what is needed and probably should have been the first point. But we have to remember, when President Trump hastily issued the first, po the first order, uh, he didn't have everybody fully in staff. We did not have an attorney general confirmed, as well as other staff members. So this is what happens when you actually lay out a good plan. Granted, I agree with your reporter, it still will see some challenges in the courts. However, this actually clears up some of those loop loopholes that the first one was known for. Well, now, let's, let's uh, take you on to the matter of uh, how uh, President Obama is supposed to have tapped his phones. Uh, it seems that nobody in the intelligence services believes this. Well, I don't know about that one. I think what we're seeing with this call out in a tweet that came out this weekend was basically a calling of bluff of poker. For the past few months, that's what we have heard, is that supposedly there's these Russian connections, that 17 intelligence agencies have come out and said that there were Russian connections between the Trump campaign uh, and, and the, the intelligence over in Russia. We have not seen any proof. We've actually not been able to have any tangible proof. So this is President Trump saying, listen, show me your cards right now, instead of just doing these blanket supposed things that are happening, we know it didn't happen, so it's time for you to actually show us and show the American people why you continue to have this type of accusation. Uh, given the, um, uh, and I'll stay with you for a moment, because to, given, given the concern down the years of the Russian mafia activities, the intersection with the Russian banks and the rest of it, uh, you'll be aware that there are two Russian banks in Trump Tower. It would be not surprising if they were indeed tapped. Um, uh, do you think there's a possibility that your Mr. Trump has got confused between him being tapped and the Russians being tapped? Well, either way, there was a conversation that was tapped, and so we have to decide what is more detrimental, the fact that we are tapping private citizens' phones, especially one that is running against opponent. You remember, President Obama did actively go on the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton, or that we are, we are tapping foreign diplomats' phones. Both of those are highly concerning right now in our foreign policy. So both of those, I think, need to be exposed. I think that's what President Trump is doing. So yes, were there probably conversations that happened because of the logistics of having a Russian bank at Trump Tower? Probably. But were any of those actually going to show that there were ties with the Trump campaign to, to with Russia to help bring down or to help hurt the Hillary Clinton campaign? Those have yet to actually see the light of day. John Sandrick, the critical issue about any border protection is that it protects the country from terrorism and the rest of it. Now, we found it difficult to find any evidence of any terrorists having actually come from any of the six countries that are now on this travel ban. I'm just wondering, do you actually think that the right people are being kept out of America or not? I mean, have they targeted the right countries? Hey, John, listen, we had very effective prevention mechanisms to screen individuals before they came to the United States prior to this order. Uh, the biggest threat we face in the United States are the so-called homegrown extremists. Individuals who have been here before, who entered this country or were born in this country and were not radicalized, uh, until, they, until they had lived here. They were not radicals when they came into the country. That's where we need to focus our attention. Uh, just blindly, you know, as the Department of Homeland Security's own intelligence and analysis division said itself, blindly barring individuals from these countries makes uh, very little sense and doesn't advance our security interests. The, the country that, of course, did produce the largest number of uh, terrorists was Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, are you surprised? I mean, perhaps that's all under control now and they don't need to be um, vetted before they come here come to America. Well, I think that highlights 
Yeah, I think that highlights the fact that this is just political theater. Uh, Saudis are free to travel. Pakistanis are free to travel. Look, the way to do this is through individualized assessments of each individual, not by blanket categorizations of nationality. A lot of folks who have fled these countries and are living abroad are going to be barred as a result of this order. So folks who are living perhaps in London who are uh, Somalis, although not UK citizens, they're going to be impacted by this order. It, all this does is foster this reputation that we are an anti-Muslim country without enhancing our security one, one bit. Well, that is really the, 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 the key issue, is it not, uh, Scotty Nell Hughes? The truth of the matter is that these do nothing to improve on the situation which already existed, which, as you've just heard, was fairly comprehensive and pretty good. Well, with all due respect, I have to disagree, because why I think these countries were put on there is the countries like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, uh, they already have vetting systems that I guess our intelligence says is at least better than the other five countries that are not. Uh, I think this is all about putting the world on notice, and this is just step one, and hence why it's a temporary ban on these countries to kind of say, no, we are going to put you on notice that we expect your security systems to be just as thorough as ours in other countries. This is just, I believe, a, a step one to see possibly uh, see if we can get these countries up to par with what the rest of the countries, what the rest of the world is having to deal with and the expectations that we expect of them. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, this is hardly the most comprehensive list. Uh, if you really wanted to pursue all the people who were a threat to America, you'd really keep most people out. I mean, um, Mexicans onwards. Well, but that's why we're talking about strengthening our border security down on our southern border. But like I said, this is all about encouraging these countries to step up to the step up to the process and put in their own security features, like other countries, like France, like England, other countries are having to do at their ports and at their airports. So I think that's what this, ultimately this is, is just sending that message that we want you to beef up your own security, and and this is just a short short term ban uh, to encourage them to do it on their own before the United States has to step in and help. Well, John Sandrick, that sounds as if uh, you're being accused of having failed at every turn. <laughs> well, listen, look, the security situation in countries like Yemen and Somalia are, is a disaster. Everybody knows that, and it's been a you know, critical foreign policy goal of the United States for a long time to enhance the security in those countries. But by just barring the, the citizens of those countries or nationals of those countries from coming to the U.S. sends a big message to the world that we're anti-Muslim without advancing our actual security interests or even incentivizing those countries any further to fix things. Uh, it was already in, almost impossible. Imagine being walking into Yemen, the U.S. Embassy in Yemen, applying for a tourist visa. That doesn't happen. Nobody got them before, only the very rare cases. Um, so this, again, it sends a, the wrong message without advancing, you know, actually making us safer. Uh, Scotty Nell Hughes, let's just finalize on the, uh, finish up on the question of the tweets. I mean, uh, 24 hours ago, there was an absolute cascade of tweets from uh, President Trump in which not only uh, was, was mis his predecessor really abused, verbally abused, um, a sick and a bad man and the rest of it, which I don't think any previous president has ever said of his predecessor, but also it is extraordinary um, claims of, of phone tapping and the rest of it. Um, are you happy with the president's state of mind? Well, I, I am happy, but I think what we're hearing in these tweets is a frustration at the narrative that is coming out. And that might even be a part of his own administration, as I am frustrated with the narrative. Here we have this excellent speech of unity that we saw Tuesday night that President Trump gave, and immediately we're thrown into this sort of chaos. The narrative is somehow not being handled right. We're not getting the right information out, and we're allowing it to be twisted to where it can be used uh, to say that this is a Muslim ban, as, as my colleague just said on air, which it's not, because it's only a small amount of Muslims that are Muslim countries, part of it. Th that, I think that is where the tweets are coming from. President Trump is frustrated that the narrative is not actually getting out to the good things that he wants to focus on. Rather, it is being okay. skewed and spin to focus on the bad.